Amen. We're making room for the Lord to move in our lives. Every time we come together and worship, we're making room for him to move and touch us and change us. So just turn with me. We just we finished off here with just I'll stand upon my watch, my rampart and see what he would say to me. And uh, so just turn with me to Isaiah 50. Verse 7, for the Lord God will help me, therefore I will not be disgraced or discouraged. Therefore I have set my face like a flint, and I know that I will not be ashamed. According to Isaiah 50 and verse 7. So you're not going to be ashamed, you're going to receive what you have asked for him. And of him. As you set your face like a flint. Now this is a prophecy about Jesus. Obviously 700 years ago. Or before his. 700 years before his. Before he was born. And brought to the earth. He knew the plan. The vision. The flint. The firmness. He knew it. And he had a, a, a firmness about the plan of what the Lord had in store for him. That he would be the suffering servant. That he would be the one that would be the spotless lamb for the nations of the earth. For Israel. You need to have something to set your face like a flint to. You need a vision. You need to have something that your face is set like a flint to. And Jesus obviously is that one we're looking to. We're setting our face like a flint towards him. But also a vision. Also a purpose of why you're here. And the purpose of why you're here is to glorify God in your body. To glorify him in your health and in your healing that you experience. That glorifies God. That glorifies the Lord Jesus Christ. Because remember, Jesus glorified the Heavenly Father. Father. It's the church now. He gave us the glory. Jesus gave us the glory. So now we're going to glorify Jesus and we're going to glorify the Father. Amen. Amen. And glorify and allowing his glory and his power and his presence to rest in our body and produce the health and healing and also operate in miracles, signs, wonders, preach the gospel. Every time we preach the gospel, we're glorifying God in our bodies. And in Hebrews chapter 12. Verse 1, it says, Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Now, I know that I talked about this, but looking unto Jesus, Jesus is the one that we're looking to. He's the one that we're setting our faces like a flint to. The author and the finish of our faith who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the Father, the throne of God. Why did he sit down at the right hand of the throne of God? For it is finished. It was done. Now he's going to sit there until he calls us up. We meet him in the sky, and we go hang out there for seven years. And then we get to come back with him and he's going to get up and it's and and that's that's it. God's taking care of things. So surrounded surrounded things that easily surround you in circle, easily distracted, those are those things that that come around and and try to to uh, buffer you. You know, uh sickness and disease is a thing that distracts That's what it's there. It's to distract you from the purpose. It's to distract you from the goal. It's to distract you from your eyes being set on Jesus. 
for he's the one who's the author and the finisher of your faith. When your faith is finished for healing, you're going to receive your miracle. You have your miracle. It's yours. I'm going to keep saying you're healed because it's the truth. That's God's word. You're healed. He healed you. Healed. Past tense. It's done. You receive it. You walk it out You in your body. We're going to talk a little bit more about this encompassing and surrounding um, So, it properly well planted all around, describing what is encompassing, encircling, surrounding, whole, around. So you got people right here that you're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses that have gone on before you. They're all around, properly well planted around. I mean, I'm making sure that I've, because it's been a while but since I let me make sure this is right. Yep. Holy around. Okay, this is not concerning the uh, the great cloud of witnesses, so I apologize to that right here because it's uh, this is a study that I've done a long time ago, and so I'm trying to remember. What word, and I wished I would have actually put the actual word, the proper word there in front of it. And I didn't, the one that makes, you know, in English, I only have the one that's in Greek right there. So I just had to read through this a little bit more. So it's there to, to be, it's, it's, it's literally planted around you. It's a distraction. It's something that's pitted against you from the enemy. And figured the a serious hindrance that encircles or hampers someone who desperately needs to advance. Burden, hindrance, distraction will be thrown at you because now this is the burden part. This is the part that is is right up here. Um, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. So the weight is that burden. It's a hindrance, a distraction. Will be thrown at you to keep you from reaching your goal. See, those things you want to totally cast aside. So that's why it's important that we commit our works to the Lord so that our plans will be established in Proverbs chapter 16 and verse 3. We want to continue to commit our works to the Lord, stay focused, keep our eyes focused on the Lord Jesus Christ, and not allow these things to encircle us and actually take root and plant, and plant themselves around about us. If we st stop running our race and start looking and, and, and allow these things to knock us off our course, which is so easily beset us, because we have already explained that, that besetting is the same thing as like a runner who runs alongside of you in a race and he would sit here and try to bump you off the off the course. It's easy it's easy to come along somebody, right? It says so easily besets you. It's easy to come along some si alongside a runner, right? And just kind of go like that and then they they're they're like that. It, they're, Now, that's why it's important that we're planted in the Lord and that we're made strong in the Lord, that we keep our eyes on Jesus, and then those things can't knock us off our course. They might be a little distraction, but go, oh, we got the victory. Immediately, you're already, your mind's on the victory. You're, you're immediately already, your eyes are on Jesus. Immediately, you already know you're walking through this. You're not, sta you're not camping in the valley of the shadow of death. You're, you're rising up out of this thing. So you keep your face set like a, a flint. I mean, you have some gumption. You got some fight in you. The gospel is a strong man's gospel. It's not for the faint of heart or the weak. 
but it's a strong man's gospel. But guess what? When you're weak, he makes you strong. So just recognize that. But you've got to recognize that to, in order to receive the strength of the Lord. So we commit our works to the Lord. And our plans will be established. I mean, they'll be planted. They will, that, that it's done. It's rooted in. Your plans will be established as long as you continue to commit your works to the Lord. As long as you involve God in what you're doing and everything that you do, then your that's how the plans, that's how it will be established. But you're not planning, doing your own plans. You're hearing fir- first from Him. Remember, you stood on the rampart to hear what he's going to say to you. Then you write down the, plan, the vision. And you keep your eyes focused on what really matters. You don't lose sight. And obviously we continue to meditate on his word and that's how we're going to know what the plans of God are. There's the written word of God, his plan, which is is written how we're to live our lives. But then, then there's the spoken word of God, the revelation, and you know what the perfect will of God is for your life. Now, we've already camped out here in, in Romans chapter 12, but we can go there again. I mean, it's, it's great because it's just building faith on the inside so that you know exactly what the perfect will of God is for you his will is that vision his will is the vision that he gives you his will is his word obviously how he sees you and how he wants you to live amen it's his ways that are higher than our ways his thoughts that are higher than our thoughts Romans 12, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable of God, which is your reasonable service. Verse 2, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. It doesn't happen unless you get alone. And break open the word of God and break bread with the Lord Jesus. He, he says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. Why? So that I can come in and sup with you. He wants to eat with you. He wants to take care of you. He wants to lay out God's heart and his plan and his purpose for you. So that you're not left wondering and you're not confused. Confusion comes from the enemy. See, that's, that's another thing that comes alongside to try to easily beset you, confusion. If I can just confuse the believer, if I can get them to take their focus off the word, why did this happen? Why did that happen? What? No, keep your eyes on the word. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Keep your face set like a flint. Keep, your, your, you know, keep coming to the Father in prayer like Jesus did. Amen? I'm going, to receive, I'm going to read this again out of Isaiah 50, verse 7. For the Lord God will help me. Therefore, I will not be disgraced. Therefore, I have set my face like a flint, and I know that I will not be ashamed. You will not be ashamed when you walk in Christ's firmness. And no wise will you be put to shame because you know what the will of God is. You know what it takes to fulfill the plan and the purpose of God for your life. You know what it takes to grab a hold of your health and your healing. You don't let go. You keep seeing yourself walking in the wholeness of God, the health of God, and thanking Him. And you keep looking to Jesus. Who will finish it who will finish your faith. He's the author and the finish of your faith. He's going to do it. You trust him. Verse 
Now there's some gumption. There's some, <coughs> excuse me. There's a gumption, there's a fight that, that's, that's to be in the believer. Yes, there's rest. Yes, there's those things. But I believe that there's those times where you got to press through and press in. Now, you don't always want to have to live in that press in, pressing through stage of your life where it's like always, you know, you feel like he gives you those seasons of rest. And, you, and then there's those times you got to rise up, you got to fight. You got to fight the good fight of faith. You know, grab a hold of the blessing of God for your life. Um, again, like I, I, I think I touched a little earlier this morning about, you know, why I, some people have to fight for the healing and why some don't. Uh, you know, everybody's walk is different. But they just need to simply understand that they're going to glorify God. Just like Jesus, they said, well, who's, who, when he talked about the, 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 the child that was, um, I don't know if he was born blind or if it was the one that was uh, lame, but uh, yeah, it was the one that was deaf and dumb, I believe. Why was this, you know, why was it, was it because of his parents who sinned or, or, or this guy, you know, that he was born in sin so he would be uh, deaf and dumb? And he says, neither. It's so that the glory of God could be revealed. So just don't, we don't get caught up. Why? The, what the whole thing is, is we just don't get caught up in the why. We just, we get caught up in that we're going to glorify God in our bodies. We're going to get caught up in the fact that this is going to glorify God. You can get caught up in this, well, it's because of this, and, and, and you, know, you know, doing these whole, you know, that's why I don't really totally dig the whole going back into, you know, generation after generation after generation, and people come together and they pray, and so I believe that... Uh, you know, you had somebody in your uh, a lineage of a family that would, they were, they were witches, and because of that, how do you get that? You don't even. Once you were born again, the, the, the curse is broken. Once you're born again, the curse is broken. And and, and are there some things that maybe might come upon? That, you know, yeah, it's this familiar spirit that was, you know, that was from your family. And gets you kind of going, oh, my gosh, am I cursed? No, you're not cursed. Remember, the curse was destroyed. Jesus fulfilled the curse of the law. So how is that even possible to carry on in your life once you're born again? Now, the enemy will try to get away with things. What you don't know, so you take authority over that. Say, no. The curse of the law has been destroyed. Jesus destroyed that. He fulfilled the law. He fulfilled all of that. He was made a curse for me, so I don't have to be cursed. That's the truth of God's word. You just received the salvation. It's no longer you that lives anyway. It's Christ that lives in you. So how can we sit here and talk around, well, my grandma had, she just had the same issues and the same problems. Yeah, you know, uh, this, this whole thing of, of, of mental illness runs in the family. No, it does not. You, why are you speaking that? Speaking that only gives that thing power to operate in your family's lineage. Don't allow that. You take authority in the name of Jesus. I bind you. You don't operate in this family no more because the blood, the blood of Jesus has, has destroyed that thing, has cleansed me of all unrighteousness. I was delivered at the cross because I died with Jesus and I raised with him in the newness of life. That's the truth. So if you died with Jesus and rose with him, uh, rose with him in the newness of life, then how in tarnations can a generational curse follow you through that? It can't. You're dead to the world, and the world is dead to you. What do I have to do with you and you with me? The curse is destroyed because the anointing destroys the yoke of bondage. There's freedom in this place right now. 
There's some revelation happening right now. Because we were taught, I mean, I, miss, I, I remember talking about, the, you know, the whole roots of, you know, all these roots and all these different things and all that. We're just sitting here studying all this stuff about what sin produces and, you know, generational curses and all this garbage. Why don't you just study the fact that you were died with Christ and you raised with him in the newness of life? That right there just ends that whole thing, that whole argument. Just it's, 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 it's kaput. Kaput off of its head. How can we keep holding on to thinking about the generation? Oh, that only empowers that thing to still keep trying to operate in your life. Or in your family's life. We believe nonsense like that. You hold the truth of God's word. You hold Romans uh, chapter 6 to that. And, and it just like destroys the argument completely. Of generational curses. On a born again family? Really? How is that possible? My mind does not compute. The only, why, the only reason why would, we would possibly see something that looks like it was uh, on our family beforehand. You know, and if we're saved and born again, the only reason is that what we're allowing. Because we don't have the full revelation understanding that that curse has been destroyed. Jesus took the curse of the law of sin and death. Any generational curse is all really only a part of the curse of the law. You've got to understand that. That's all curse of the law. There isn't nothing new under heaven. There isn't any kind of new curses. They're destroyed. So don't allow those things to, to even cause you to lose focus on the reality of what Christ has already finished on Calvary's cross. Keep your face set like a flint on his truth. It's truth that makes us free. You people, right now you're receiving freedom right now. His freedom because of this truth and this understanding. Amen. Wow, where did I go here? So we just continue to focus on the Lord. We continue to press into the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Amen. Now turn t with me to Genesis chapter 32, verse 22. Hallelujah. Because we're talking about that, that fight. You need to have some fight to keep your face set like a flint. To keep your heart burning. Even if you got to pray all night to grab a hold of what you need. Even if you got to fast and pray like we talked about and you got to go after something that you really have been, it's been a, it's been a fight for you. You're fighting your fight of faith. And like I said, for each person, it's different. Maybe it's going to take you needing to fast for 14 days or 21 days and pray until you grab a hold of what you're believing for so that you can see Father God more clearly, whatever it is. Now, I, don't I, I still don't believe that it has to be that, but if that's... Wow, let me, I shouldn't say it that way. In some cases, it needs to be that way. Maybe I should say that. Now, it's not, God's not the problem. He's ready to heal you now. Where it's the problem, it's our thinking or our believing that's the issue. Or a doubt of some type that's standing in the way. 
And that's when fasting and pray, pray, praying moves you to a position to receive. So that's, that's a little bit more how I'd like to put it. Because he's ready to heal you right now. And you can take it right now. And even in this moment, the word can come forth. And he says, is not my word like a hammer that breaks the rock. There's like a breaking that takes place of a mindset or a stronghold to God's word. And you can receive your healing as well. Amen. So in Genesis uh, verse 32, and he arose. This is Jacob. And he arose that night and took his two wives, his two female servants, and his 11 sons, and crossed over the ford of uh, Jabbok. He took them and sent them over the brook and sent over what he had. <clears throat> then Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until the break of day. Now when he saw that he did not prevail against him, he touched the socket of his hip, and the socket of Jacob's hip was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, let me go for the day breaks. But he said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, what is your name? He said, Jacob. And he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. For you have struggled with God. And with men and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked, saying, Tell me your name, I pray. And he said, Why is it that you ask about my name? And he blessed him there. So Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face in my life is preserved <laughs> just as he crossed over Penuel the sun arose on him and he limped on his hip now I want you to see something here now obviously he, he saw a face he was face to face with God now I know some people will again I'll kind of touch on this he said, hold on, how can you see God and, and still live? Because even God says, you can't see my face and live. But it was just like when Moses and him met face to face in the tabernacle when he came down in the tent. It wasn't, it was, it was the form in which God came. It was like also in Abraham, when, when the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit came and met him and he came out and met them. It wasn't just three angels. It was Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. They came in the form of a man. All right? God can show up in the form that he desires to show up in, in, in that way. Well, look, look, I mean, he, 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 he showed up in a, as in a burning bush before Moses spoke out of the bush to Moses. So, so what I'm saying is he can come and he can speak to you however he wants to speak to you. But he chose to, to, to come and wrestle You know, and it was his tenaciousness that was wrestling with God. I will not let you go, go until you bless me. And then he changed his name. Well, we know what his name was. It was Deceiver. You're no longer going to be called Deceiver. But it shall be Israel. Amen. It shall be Israel. He gave him a whole new name, a bless, to, to be a blessing instead of a pain in the butt. <laughs> he said, you prevailed against man, now you're going to prevail. Because listen, he prevailed against uh, um, his father-in-law. I can't think of his name right now. And then he prevailed against his own brother. That showed up later as he went out and met him and Esau he prevailed so he wrestled with man he wrestled with God and he prevailed and as he wrestled with the Lord 
he got his blessing. I will not let you go until you bless me. And there's those times that you got to just dig in and say, God, I'm not letting you go until you bless me, until I get my answer, what I'm crying out for from you. And I know that you're not holding it back from me. And I know that this is an Old Testament. But I do know that I have a covenant right to receive the things that I'm asking of you. And I'm not asking you that it's outside of, the, of your word and outside of your truth. You know, that, that's outside. So, God, I thank you that I'm receiving my healing in Jesus' name because you promised in your word healing and health. And if it takes you having to get in and fast and pray till you break through and grab a hold of it and that you, you, you are able to grab a hold of the altar of God, you come before the throne of grace, amen, to find help in time of need, to receive. That blesses the heart of God when he sees his children come to him in such a way. God, I'm, that means I'm serious about this, Lord. Because you know what's going to happen is it's going to glorify God in your body when you walk in your miracle and you grab a hold of that truth and you receive the blessing of healing. It's a promise that's yours. That you overcame doubt. You overcame circumstances. You overcame uh, um, something that stood in the way of you receiving it. And you were positioned, you, you're able to position yourself in the right place, the right attitude and the right heart. And you allow God to work within you His will and His desire. Hallelujah. And then in Matthew chapter 15 and verse 21 through 28. Then Jesus went out from there and departed to the region of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a woman of Canaan came from the re of that region and cried out to him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely demon-possessed, but he answered her not a word. And, he, and his disciples came... And urged him, saying, Send her away, for she cries out after us. But he answered and said, I was not sent except to the lost house, the sheep of the house of Israel. Then she came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, It's not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. So first off, he already told her, I've, not, I've only come to the, the lost house of Israel. Go, go be on your way. And then finally he goes, it's not good to give the children's bread and throw it to little dogs. I mean, she kept after him. And she said, oh, yes, Lord, yet even the little dogs eat the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered and said to her, oh, woman, great is your faith. Let it be to you as you desire. And her daughter was healed from that very hour. Listen, you get the, you're a child, so you get the bread. It's the, it, the, healing is the children's bread. You know, she was begging for it. You don't have to beg for it. You just thank him for it. But like I said earlier, if you got to get in and, and, and fast and pray and get real serious about pressing in and just saying, Lord, whatever things that need to change in my heart so that I can walk in what has been promised to me, then this is what I'm doing. It's been done. You have blessed me. Your word says this. I believe it. And I'm serious about it. I'm showing you that I'm serious about this right now. I'm fasting. I'm putting a food aside. I'm praying. I'm pressing into you. I'm setting aside time to, to, to lock into you. And, and that's what you're doing even here right now. You're setting aside time to lock into the Lord to receive what he has promised already to you in his word. You're not begging for it. You're a child. You're not a beggar in the street. You're a child. You're a son of God. And a robe of righteousness has been put upon your shoulders. The signet ring has been put on. He's put shoes on you, so that means you're not a slave. But you're a son. 
And you know what I mean, women. You know what I mean when I say that. Amen. So healing is yours. The fatted calf is yours. The blessing is yours. Hallelujah. And then in Luke chapter 18, verses 1 through 8, then he spoke a parable to them that men always ought to pray and not lose heart, saying, There was in a certain city a judge who did not fear God nor regard men. Now there was a widow in that city, and she came to him, saying, Get justice for me from my adversary, and he would not for a while. But afterward he said within himself, Though I do not fear God nor regard man, yet because this widow troubles me, I will avenge her. In other words, at least she... she, uh, Least by her continual coming, she weary me, overtake me, (laughs) jump me in the (laughs) alley. Then the Lord said, hear what the unjust judge said, and shall God not avenge his own elect who cry out day and night to him? Come on now, hear this. Hear the words of the Lord. This is out of the mouth of Jesus speaking to you directly. And shall God not avenge his own elect who cry out to him? His own elect, his chosen, his saints who cry out day and night to him, though he bears long with them. I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find, really find faith on the earth? He's looking to see if he'll really find faith in you when he comes back. He wants to find faith. In other words, will you continue to fight the good fight of faith and not give up and make sure that you see the miracle all the way through, what he has promised you all the way through, that you will not relax, that you will not give up. Men always ought to pray and not give up. That's what he's saying. So when I come back, will I really find faith on the earth or will I find those that have tried for a while and just kind of, okay, I gave up. We can't give up, but we need to... uh, 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 you know, pull up our bootstraps and get busy and fight that good fight of faith. Wrestle with the Lord God if you got to do it. Whatever you got to do to receive revelation and understanding for what he has provided for you. Because you're not begging for it. You're fighting to receive it. What is yours already. And once you gain your victory, the more it becomes easier and easier and easier. Amen. He will avenge them speedily, I tell you. He will avenge them speedily. Now, you know, ask. You know, that one passage where the Lord talks about ask, seek, knock. In that, it means keep on asking. Keep on seeking, or knock, ask, and seek. Keep on knocking. Keep on asking and keep on seeking. You keep it on. You keep up with it and you get it. You'll receive it. And he was even talking about receiving the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Hmm. 
Now, there is a part where I believe there is that asking um, because he wants to see that you have faith. Lord, I thank you. I received it. It's not, not the begging part, but I ask you for my healing right now. I ask you for what you've promised me in your word and your truth. See, that blesses the heart of Father. Not only that, it also makes it personal. It makes it relational. And Father's heart will be moved and he will work on your behalf because you came to him as a child. You came to him with faith like a child. Amen? Well, just like your child, when they go, I want some food, they're not begging. They're asking of something that they already, already know is in the refrigerator, that they know that is already was bought and purchased for them. They say, I would like some food, please. Now, obviously, as they get older, in the Lord, now, as they get older, even in our own home, I'm hungry. Well, there's food in the refrigerator. Make yourself a sandwich. Make yourself a sandwich. Amen. As Napoleon, Gra uh, Napoleon Dynamite's grandma said, make yourself a dang quesadilla. <laughs> Darn it, Napoleon, make yourself a dang quesadilla. <laughs> Hallelujah. Now, Philippians chapter 3, verse 7 through 16. But what things were gained to me, these I have counted a loss for Christ. Yet indeed, I also count all things a loss. This is in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 7 through 16. But what things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. Yet indeed, I also count all things a loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering, being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the, the goal of the, for the mark of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, let us, as many as are mature, have this mind. And if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal even this to you. Nevertheless, to the degree that you have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us be of the same mind. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. I mean, that's pretty straightforward. Just press in to the mark of the high call of God, looking to Jesus, the author and the finisher of faith. There's just that your face set like a flint. You wrestle with God to get your answer. Whatever it is, you're continuing to, to apprehend that which has apprehended you. You're apprehending it. You're apprehending him who has apprehended you because of your confession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. He's came, he's made his home within you. So now you're apprehending the full blessing of the life of Christ in you, of the hope of glory that's in you. Christ, the hope of glory. Amen.
Thank you, Jesus. Father, we just thank you for your word. We thank you for your truth. We thank you that your word has come like a hammer. To boom! To break the rock, Father, and bring revelation, bring understanding, bring quickening to the body, life to the body in Jesus' name. And, and your word has been sent to heal them. Your, your, your word is bread that brings nourishment to their body. In Jesus' name, your body was broken for our health and for our healing. And even today, we've communed with you. We've communed with you in the work. We've broken bread together. We fellowship with you, Father. We thank you for your presence in this place. We thank you for your anointing that's released right now, producing that which we have trusted you and believed you for and, and producing the life within them because it is the entrance of your words that bring light and bring understanding to the simple. We thank you for this right now. In Jesus' name, we give you all the glory, all the praise, all the honor. In Jesus' name, amen.